Um, so we have the last session, but not the least. Um, we're going to keep you awake and uh, an alert. Um, I know you guys are going to start falling asleep, but uh, we'll keep you up. So let's go over the first slide. Uh, what are bradyarrhythmias? So bradyarrhythmias are considered any heart rate below 60 beats per minute. Okay, And the usual cause of it are sinus bradycardia, which is a lack of automaticity here of the sinus node, or sinus pause when you have a transient pause on that sinus, or sinus eight, atrial exit block, that the energy doesn't come out of the sinus node. Then you have the atrioventricular block, which is actually the conduction of the electricity to this node over here doesn't go down, and then or a block down below. So as you can see, it's a pathway that comes from the top to the bottom of the heart. The usual symptoms are lightheaded fatigue, syncope, and near syncope. And it's pretty dangerous to give medication really to treat this type of uh, arrhythmia in the outpatient setting. So that's why we came with the pacemakers, which is the definitive one, right? For you guys that are new here and don't don't know much about pacemaker, I'm gonna start very basic and we're gonna go more into the deep, but the pacemakers have two major components, the pulse generator, which is the CAN, okay? And the lead, okay? The pulse generator, the CAN has a connector. As you can see here on the top, that's where you put on the lead and then you screw it in, okay? As you can see, the connectors can vary because you can have different type of CANs and different type of leads. For example, you can have a single chamber, which is only one connector, okay? Or a dual chamber, meaning two connectors, or a by B, usually three connectors. Sometimes also you have connectors for the coil in case of the fibrillators. Then we have uh, the leads right here. For example, this is an example of a quadrupolar lead. You can see one, two, three, four. But you can have bipolar or unipolar, okay? So that's a kind of overview of the component of a pacemaker. But how do they really work a pacemaker? Pacemaker are just a simple stopwatch, okay? They, they, the idea is to maintain rhythm. And they do two major functions there. They do pace and sense. That's the only two things that a pacemaker will do for you, okay? So this is an example of atrial capture. As you can see, there's a pacing spike, okay? And after the pacing spike, there's an atrial depolarization followed by a QRS. That atrial depolarization should be followed by a mechanical contraction. But we cannot see it here, but we infer that it's present, okay? Now, as you can see, every spike has an atrial capture there, okay? That meaning that all bead has been successfully captured. That's the definition of it, okay? This is an example of ventricular capture. As you can see, this is much wider, the QRS, okay? And every spike is followed by a QRS. Now, what is the concept of threshold? And what is important in that? So threshold is important because that is the minimum amount of energy necessary to really capture the, vent the ventricle or the atrium 100% of the time. Why is it important? Well, when you are setting up your pacemakers for your patients, you want to know what's the threshold so you can put a safety margin to go above of it. So in, a, in that case, he doesn't miss any single beat, okay? Usually during acute implants is when the major vari variability can happen. In chronic settings, usually this threshold doesn't change too much, okay? So we used to put a safety margin way bigger in the acute implants, and then we try to decrease it even lower to save energy, to save battery, and hopefully to do the change out later on, okay? So about this threshold and capture, I wanna give you a concept and a fundamental out of this talk, okay? First of all, when you modify the pulse generator by the can, okay, you have two variables that you basically you can play. You have the pulse amplitude and you have the pulse duration. So the pulse amplitude, as you can see, everything above to this side is captured and everything under here is non-captured. So as you increase the pulse amplitude, you, lead, you need less pulse duration. Or if you keep going on the pulse duration, there's a point that you reach that you don't need to increase the pulse amplitude anymore. And that will give you a constant capture. So that's important about the threshold. These two variables can help you to maintain capture in a patient that it might be pace dependent, okay? Now I wanna explain you a little bit more of this concept. So imagine that these pockets are the cells, okay, that you wanna stimulate, okay? And these cells are in a resting phase. This resting phase is this phase four right here, okay? They usually have many mechanisms how to protect to be depolarized by minimal stimulus. So it's important that you give the right amount of energy that will decrease the trans transmembrane uh, gradient that it has these cells in resting, okay? When you decrease that 
trans uh, transmembrane gradient, you read through the threshold. You read through the phase zero and you will depolarize, okay? And this depolarization then will follow for a phase one, phase two, and phase three repolarization. What's basically happening, all the energy that you deliver to the cell will come out. But this threshold, imagine, is right here, okay? In this bucket, okay? So the water, if you feel it and you don't reach that threshold, it won't depolarize, okay? So you have to make sure that you give enough energy to surpass that threshold. Now, we talk about the two prior concepts. We talk about pulse width, we talk about um, the voltage that you give, right? So imagine the voltage to be the size of the water tap, okay? The bigger the size of the water tap to drain the water, that's your voltage. And basically the pulse width is how, how often you leave that water tap running, okay? So these are the two variables that you're actually playing with when you try to depolarize a resting cardiac cells, okay? Perfect, so this is an example of failure of capture, okay? You can see ventricular loss of capture. And you can see there, this pacing spike did not capture, and this pacing spike did not capture, and this one didn't capture, okay? And it actually was programmed to that rate. You see, this, this cycle length from here to here is the same as this cycle length from here to here. So why do we see that? Well, basically, we're probably under the threshold, number one. Number two, the lead could be dislodged easily, perforated in the, in the wrong chamber, okay? or the, what we call an exit block, meaning there's a scar that forms around the lead and doesn't permit the energy to transfer. However, now these days we have the lead, we put steroids on the tip. This is a usually phenomenon that in the past. And with the steroids, we minimize the scar formation around the, on the lead. This is also very common in um, epicardial leads. When you place epicardial lead, they tend to scar pretty significantly. And the, li the life length of this tends to be way shorter than a transvenous one, okay? Now let's see another example of failure of pace. This is a, what we call ventricular loss of output. As you can see here, there's no even a spike. So why this happened? So in this case, you have to think about, well, maybe the screw when they put the pacemaker wasn't correctly, or the battery is about to die, okay? Or the pacemaker, or the pacemaker was inhibited incorrectly meaning he thought there was a QRS over there, and there's none. So that's pretty much the problem with capturing with pacemaker. There's some variants about capture. You, this is like one of them. This is what we call fusion beat. Okay, so as you can see, this is a fully paced ventricle, and this is a intrinsic. And what is a fusion? Actually, it's a depolarization of a ventricle or atrium from two energy sources. One is the intrinsic in this case, and the other one is the pace. As you can see, that, that beat looks like the intrinsic and also looks like the pace. Okay, so that's the way you can find out why is, how is a fusion beat. Now, what is a pseudo-fusion beat? Well, you think you have a fusion beat, but you really don't. How is that possible? Well, as you can, guys can see here, this is the intrinsic. It looks exactly like intrinsic, but you have a pace beat. But really, the pace didn't activate the ventricle or the atrium at all. It really didn't touch him. So that's what we call a pseudo-fusion beat. So if somebody asks you about fusion, pseudo-fusion, you have an idea. This is another possibility with pacemaker, what, what it's about, cross-stimulation. If you have an atrial lead in this example that you're pacing, and you can see you're capturing the A finally, and you have the intrinsic over, and you crank up the power, it goes on the pulse width, or you goes on the, or on the voltage, you can do what you do is you're activating the other chamber. So you're able to transmit the energy to the ventricle and actually capture it. So that's what we call crosstalk. If you come down on the power, you're probably gonna go back to what only atrium capture. So it's something you have to put in mind. In the past, there were other mechanisms that how that happened, but now these days with this new device, not necessary to go over it. What about sensitivity? We'll talk about the two things that pacemakers do. One pace, two sense. Okay, so the sensitivity. If we put for the sensitivity in this case at five millivolts, you guys will see, well, there's a gentleman over there, really nothing else going on, right? So you decrease the threshold of the sensitivity to probably to one, and you figure out there was something else there. It was a dragon, it was scaring the guy, and we didn't know it, right? So what I'm trying to get with this is the lower your threshold, the more sensitive it is. So don't, don't get confused, like, oh, we're not seeing, let's crank up the sensitivity. No, no, no. It's the opposite. Decrease the numbers so you will be able to see more, okay? This is pretty 
important concept to have in your mind for in case you're dealing with a pace dependent patient and you're not seeing why. Okay, this is atrial sensing inhibition. Okay, this is the one of the function about sensing. So, like we talked before, pacemaker are like a stopwatch, okay? So here he delivered a stimulus, he captured the A, followed by a QRS, and then he will start counting. The end of the count, I didn't see uh, any atrial activation, so I will deliver another pacing stimulus, okay? It's right here, and then it comes one PAC right there, and that's why he was resetted. And it's not, you're not resetting by the QRS, you're resetting by the P, okay? Because you're sensing on the P. And that's why it resets and go back again and pace again. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, what about the ventricle? Well, the ventricle is the same principle. You deliver the beat, you start counting, okay? And if you see uh, QRS stimulized, then you will reset at that time. Once that is resetted, you start looking again. You didn't see anything, you will pace. Start again. You see something, you inhibit. So that's the basic function of a pacemaker. Pretty straightforward. All right, few caveats with sensing, or you can oversense or undersense, okay? Let's go for a few examples of them. This is ventricular oversensing. You can see here, this is a pacemaker, which is probably a VVI mode, okay? And you can see it's set at 75 beats per minute. This is the nominal cycle length that you start looking. But in this case, where the circle, red circles are, he did not deliver a spike. Why? Because he thought there was a QRS in that, and that's why he was inhibited. But it really wasn't there, anything. So how is this possible? Well, there are many explanations, and you have to run through a differential diagnosis. One is myopotential. Sometimes you're sensing far away muscles that are in the lead, okay, over-penetrated leads. The other possibility is outside um, mechanical, okay, like LVAD. Sometimes they can produce electromagnetic interference that can uh, sense the, the, the pacers, okay? Very rarely also there is what they call a concealed extra potentials in the ventricle, meaning that there was a depolarization on the ventricle, but nobody else saw it, and it was very limited to that. Okay, uh, insulation problems is another cause of it. And now we go to the other part. If you see these on a strip, you already know there's a problem with the pacemaker, we have to fix it, okay? I want you to see there's a QRS, and there's after that there's a pace. It should never be like that, okay? Uh, what is the problem here? Well, he did not recognize that it was a, a QRS right there. What are the usual problem here? Lead dislodgement. The lead is moving around, so that's why he didn't see it, and then he saw it. Um, insulation problems, okay? And the last caveat that I have to talk about pacemakers before we move on, when you talk to your rep, or any other physician, they'll tell you, what, what's the mode that the pacemaker is programmed? And they will tell you, VVI, DVD, what does that mean? Well, there is a standard nomenclature that we use, okay? For example, the first letter that you see on the mode, okay, it could be the H and the ventricle, or both. This is mean the chamber that you're pacing. So if I say A, it means that I'm only pacing the A. If I'm saying B, it's I'm only pacing the ventricle. If I'm saying D, I can pace in both. Then what chambers I'm sensing? So I'm changing, sensing the A, sensing the B, or I'm sensing both. Then the response to sensing. Response to sensing means if inhibited, we already cover that, right? If I don't see, if I see an event, I will immediately inhibit and I will start counting again. But trigger is whenever, for example, I see activity in the atrium, and then I start counting. And I don't see anything on the ventricle, I will make sure there's a QRS over there. What's the point of that? Well, for AV block, you have a page. Uh, a P, and then you want to make sure that P goes down to the ventricle. So that's why we have this trigger. What about program rate modulation, the four later? Now these days we use only rate modulation, meaning you follow the physiologics, maybe sometimes vibration, respiratory movement, and the pacemaker can increase the automaticity of rate firing of the can. That's pretty good because see, some people who are pace dependent, they want to exercise, they want to go out, and then they say, oh, I feel terrible, what's going on? Well, you increase the the rate modulation, and they feel that they can do exercise more because the, the, the pacemaker feels and then be more aggressive about incrementing the heart rate of the patient when it's an exercise. About multiple programmables and single programmable. What is that? Well, basically, when you have more than three parameters that you can program in a pacemaker, we call it multi-programmable. Single is when uh, it's less than three. And communication is when you're, you can do uh, communication with remotely, okay? And this is 
very rarely used, but basically this is for the fibrillators if you can have anti-tachycardia and shock, and we're going to go over that. And I think I finished right on time, and thank you very much. This is two pictures. I'm going to finish with it. This is the exciting coming to the pacemaker. This is the Micra, okay, leadless pacemaker. And this is uh, presented in the European. Basically, it's a, it's a pacemaker that was able to pace for 30 minutes. He was able to recycle the kinetic energy of the heart and recycle and give it back to a stimulus to the heart to pace. Thank you.